In recent years, I have focused particularly uh, on the subject of climate change and its implications. Remarkably, these impinge on almost all of the areas of research in which I've been engaged, whether they uh, are in the field of transport, environment, uh, waste avoidance, energy conservation, and so on. What has come across throughout these years is the failure of successive governments to recognise the broader implications of any policy direction being adopted. And that is the problem is compounded by the fact that the, the political parties wish to carry favour with the electorate and therefore are more concerned with providing uh, um, the changes which are likely to attract public support. The problem here lies in the fact that that public support is informed by personal decision-making and individuals, of course, uh, prefer to ignore the wider social and environmental impact of their own decision. And yet that is the source of uh, government uh, uh, policy to carry favour with them. Again, one can see that the problem is further compounded by the fact that politicians and their advisers uh, are reluctant to take as seriously as it deserves the uh, availability of new evidence which would suggest that the status quo be challenged because that would require them to admit uh, that they got it wrong uh, previously and therefore the, this reluctance has a strong influence on the speed with which change can be made. This leaves a gargantuan task for future governments in that they have got to uh, inform the public that we can no longer pursue the policies of previous years which are largely aimed and inspired by considerations of self-interest. This at a time when the interests uh, of um, the individual and indeed of the nation have got to be subsumed under uh, the wider interests covering the world at large and, of course, future generations. The justification for this bold statement uh, can be inferred from the expressions uh, of two former Prime Ministers, John Major, uh, said some years ago that, of course, at the end of the day, what matters most is the national interest. Tony Blair said, uh, of course, we all want to do the best for our children. Here, indeed, are two instances where the wider public interest, and particularly that relating to climate change and the prospects for the future, uh, need to be set. The common thread of my research is the revelation of ill-thought-out policies which appear to have been insufficiently informed by considerations of equity, justice, environment um, and indeed common sense. I would like to illustrate the relevance of what I've just said uh, to uh, the following ideas which have come about after conducting research in these areas. They're not directly related, but they indirectly are, and they are ideas which seem to me to make considerable sense, and yet, uh, in the main, they have not been adopted, and the question is why. The final area of research that I've looked at is the one really strongly related to the whole issue of equity and fairness and fair shares. The outcome can be seen in relation, for instance, uh, to the effects of rising car ownership on children's freedoms, a subject dealt with in another of these uh, films. Uh, but it illustrates the way in which equity is overlooked. The more cars and the more cars are used, the, the less freedom that children can be allowed because of the dangers caused by the rise in traffic levels. What possible justification is there for the private so-called independent schools 
for not including in their entry criteria um, where the uh, child lives in relation to the school. Obviously, the further away they live, the more likely it is that they will have to travel by motorised means, uh, usually being taken by car uh, over a longer distance than in instances where the state system for primary schools uh, obliges parents to attend their closest school, uh, uh, the, the nearest school, um, which then entails or enables uh, the children to walk or cycle um, uh, to those schools. Um, it does seem to me that the uh, um, private schools uh, ignore this consideration uh, and that they aren't challenged on it and therefore don't feel that they have a responsibility to explain to the wider public why they consider uh, that they are justified in excluding that, the, the entry criteria uh, in the way that they do. Um, it results in more congestion on the roads, it results in more danger on the roads, it, it results in more noise and pollution. And for anybody living along the routes taken uh, by uh, uh, child com commuting uh, to, to and from school, of course it, it is highly noticeable and, uh, and uh, this is certainly true um, in half terms and on school holidays where streets can be very, very quiet indeed, but on uh, school run days uh, they're congested and uh, the character of them in terms of a, a, a pleasant living environment can be very different indeed. Decisions are taken by local authorities, but it is rare indeed for them to be appraised several years after the event for two reasons. One, to learn about the care one needs to take in reaching those decisions, to think more uh, more carefully about the consequences in the future. Uh, at present, uh, the councillors will reach a decision, but they will be they will know that it's extremely unlikely that they will be taken to task for having made an unwise decision, which can only be revealed by looking back at it over time to see whether the justification for the decision was well or ill-founded. What I have proposed, therefore, is a system whereby, either as a result of public consultation or by a decision taken within a local authority, every few years a number of critical decisions which were particularly contentious uh, are uh, reviewed with the benefit of hindsight, looking back on whether there was indeed justification for reaching a decision or whether in fact the opponents of that decision um, uh, were justified in their objections. It would have those two significant benefits. Number one, I think it would make councillors more careful about how they reach decisions, knowing that they may uh, be uh, taken to task a few years later for uh, having, in effect, misled uh, fellow councillors in reaching a decision. Um, uh, and on top of that, it would be hugely beneficial in terms of the lessons one could learn about uh, future decision making just by virtue of the experience gained by that reappraisal process. There is a complementary consideration in this instance insofar as the friendship patterns adopted by children which tend to develop in the playground in primary school years is of a very different character uh, where the child can drop in on his friend by going around the corner because they're attending the same school um, than it is in the case of uh, uh, the friendship patterns uh, that can develop where in order to maintain that friendship the um, a child has in effect to negotiate with their parent to take them to and from their friend because they live sufficiently far away that the only way of getting to them is to go by car and then of course for the parent to have to go back again in order to uh, pick them up and return them safely home.
that is a consideration as far as I know has not been mentioned or commented on but the character of their friendship is very different indeed uh, than it is where it cannot be it cannot evolve and develop on a on an informal basis another instance could be seen with regard to the issue of road safety the Department of Transport some years ago published statistics showing which was the safest car, which are the safest cars to travel in, uh, from the point of view, of course, of the driver and the passengers. And the source of this information were uh, road safety and uh, road casualty statistics, which showed uh, in, against uh, mileage in those vehicles uh, the incidence of casualties, fatalities, serious injuries, and so on. Um, and not surprisingly, the conclusion of this were, was that the safest vehicles to go in were the heaviest, the stoutest, the sturdiest, uh, ideally ones with bull bars in front of them. Uh, and these then are, uh, were the ones that are recommended as being the safest vehicles. And indeed, I recall a conversation with someone uh, fairly recently who referred to the fact that um, his wife now drove a Range Rover and listened to this and he said that she felt so much more confident in that vehicle. Well, of course, that confidence wouldn't be shared by the pedestrians and cyclists along the routes that were being driven in these vehicles because if hit by those vehicles, it's far more likely that the injury or the severity of the injury would be greater. But of course, that doesn't cross the minds of people who are looking for the safest vehicles. Such distortion of the impact on others uh, can be revealed in the... Uh, in the uh, issues that are discussed in cases where perhaps a child is injured on the road and uh, then the insurance company is always looking at ways of reducing their costs and in those instances what it comes out with is that of course uh, the child was injured because the child wasn't wearing coloured clothing and therefore couldn't so easily be seen, or the parents of the child were irresponsible for allowing, allowing such a young child to be crossing the road on his or her own. Um, and of course that defrays attention from uh, the driver who was so obviously driving at such a speed uh, that he couldn't take avertive action to prevent that occurring. But it enables then the insurance company to say, ah, Ne contributory negligence on the part of the child or the child's parents. Some other major areas of research in which I've been engaged uh, have focused on the whole issue of um, economy in its uh, old-fashioned sense uh, and uh, the avoidance of waste. Uh, and I suppose the most important of these research studies was the one uh, that was uh, looking at the likely consequences of the UK putting its clocks forward uh, by an hour in summer and winter. Uh, the area of uh, waste avoidance is so well illustrated in this study because I was able to calculate how many hours of daylight were foregone uh, because we sleep in our beds uh, from for about three quarters of the year when it's light outside but come home in the evenings when it gets um, uh, dark earlier than it would otherwise get and of course those uh, hours could be used in better if the, the hours of daylight could be used far more efficiently if one were to match uh, daylight and waking hours. Waste saving can be uh, examined in, in a way also related to energy saving it's almost as if there were a malign being attempting to encourage us to waste uh, electricity um, by, and gas uh, by virtue of the fact that the meters are generally uh, placed in cupboards. Uh, the, the numbers included bear no relationship, though that's the numbers on the meters, bear no relationship uh, to the cost that is incurred or indeed the, uh, the uh, amount of CO2 emissions that are consequent upon uh, the use of gas or electricity. Uh, so they're put in, in cupboards, uh, the 
source of information doesn't relate uh, to the money uh, that is, is expended by keeping lights on or having higher temperatures. Um, uh, and that, of course, could be resolved and is now, in fact, being addressed by government and industry by the development of smart meters. But as a contribution to that, it must be close on 25 or even 30 years ago that I did a study uh, concerned with energy conservation, uh, which concluded that an invaluable contribution could be made by having an energy rating or an energy labelling of housing in particular, so that what would happen is that when properties were exchanged, a government would require a certificate showing what level of, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, insulation uh, and efficiency there was in the system, whether one's roof was insulated, cavity walls filled, draft proofing put in, and so on. And as a result of that, to have an NG label of between A and F or something like that. Well, I'm pleased to say that that proposition that I made then was indeed taken up by government and it is now in operation. But it is where uh, the waste element was the um, motivation to look further into the uh, how th uh, um, waste is uh, or was um, in fact um, encouraged rather than discouraged. Let me illustrate this theme by referring to instances where I have seen the wider public interest, uh, that is in terms of the social and environmental consequences of their decision, uh, relatively rarely cited or influencing personal decisions. Decisions are made without regard to those consequences and this, in my view, is happening to an ex such an ex increasing extent, for instance, um, it becoming rarer and rarer to challenge people on the grounds that they've ignored these consequences of their decision. Um, and even in those instances where it is uh, taken account of, uh, people who do uh, are, are more in effect caring in that regard are dismissed on the grounds that they're sanctim sanctimonious prigs or, um, or, or uh, wasting their time in making these uh, gestures. Nowhere, nowhere is this more manifest than in the spheres of transport and, and safety. For instance, people make decisions about where they go on holiday, increasingly involving air travel, they take their families uh, abroad to more and more distant places, uh, and the only consideration as far as they're concerned is what are the costs of it and whether it can be afforded and how long it will take. The consequences of that, of course, are almost as good as overlooked insofar as one is taking two very often third world countries uh, and having the local people there exposed to alien and very different cultures uh, which can have quite seriously uh, devastating effects on their traditional ways of life. Um, but even more importantly as far as uh, air travel is concerned of course the decision to fly, uh, whether it's short but obviously more importantly uh, over long distances, it has the effect of releasing more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, which uh, will absolutely have a damaging effect on the future, indeed of the family if they've got children, um, because of the fact that those emissions will be uh, accumulating in the atmosphere, um, making it ever more likely that the global temperature will rise and that uh, the uh, future habitability of the planet will thereby decline. Likewise, uh, one can make reference to the use of the car. I recall an instance when a colleague uh, who had just come back from a holiday um, mentioned the fact that she and her husband had driven over Italy over many miles, she said, through beautiful Italian countryside and beautiful Italian villages. And what was the purpose of the journey? She said, the, 
Piero della Francesca frescoes were absolutely fantastic and they were, were worth every minute of the journey, of course, uh, meaning of her journey rather than the impact of that journey through the beautiful countryside and Italian villages um, uh, whose uh, quality of life would have been marginally reduced by her husband, her husband driving the car through, through those areas. All these examples indicate that we really do need new measures uh, of, uh, of uh, success um, from uh, the perspective of taking account also, not only of the private interest, which as I say ignores very often the wider public interest, but also of that wider public interest. We, it does represent quite a challenge to social scientists, social innovators, to come up with ways and means that promote uh, the incorporation of those wider considerations into personal decision making. My antennae were out pretty sharply at that point because 10 years previously, that is 60 years ago, I had designed a pedestrian-oriented new town, the aim of which was to give pride of place to pedestrians and indeed cyclists in the design of new towns. Um, it didn't stop people using cars, but uh, it was much easier to walk from the residential areas uh, a short distance to the linear central area along which would travel, would have travelled, because it was never built, would have travelled a, 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 a public transport travelator so that one could get around without wishing to use a car and indeed one could, if one did wish to use a car, you would have to go the long way round uh, to get out of the area because you wouldn't be able to cross the linear central area. Um, but it's a further indication of uh, a recognition of the desirability of uh, planning for the mode of transport, namely walking and cycling and to a lesser extent bus, which were most, in which it was most in the public interest to encourage. Primacy is given to wheeled vehicles so that road intersections uh, are maintained at the same level uh, so that uh, vehicles can pass those uh, locations uh, with the minimum of braking or accelerating. This, of course, works to the disadvantage of pedestrians uh, because it means that they have to wait at the curbside until the road is free for them to cross so that the average speed of let's say three miles an hour is thereby reduced to an average of less than two miles an hour. What I proposed in light of that many years ago uh, was to suggest that road intersections sh should be paved over to the pavement level uh, in other words giving priority to the pedestrian, the whole square of the road crossing would be paved at that level and it would mean that pedestrians could cross on the diagonal, not having to cross the road twice if they wanted to get to the far side, um, and it would be able to be done with the minimum of interruption. Of course, this would add uh, some small time element to the progress of motor vehicles because they would have to go up onto the pedestrian uh, preserve, but that would be in a very good cause um, because it would make precious little difference, a few seconds uh, extra time given over uh, to allowing pedestrians to cross. But also it would be, mean that um, the uh, motor vehicles uh, had to give, had to slow down, making it much safer for pedestrians. And uh, yeah, unusually, uh, that concept has been widely adopted now in, by many local authorities. I recall one area of research in which I proposed uh, that uh, a major retailer include a charge for parking uh, on its premises and that the revenue from that source should be allocated for the purpose of giving free travel to people without cars. That suggestion was ridiculed at the time 
uh, on the grounds that, of course, uh, those retailers who didn't have the parking charge would be the beneficiaries of that, and uh, therefore one would be serving the interests of your competitors. Of course, uh, that is true, but nevertheless, uh, it is obvious that if the retailers were all obliged by uh, legislation to have a charge on parking, uh, then it could be used in that way, but that s further suggestion was ignored even when it was put to government and to the retailers. The wider implications of decisions made in one area uh, of policy affecting other areas of policy can be seen in the oddly in the positioning of car exhausts. If one looks at the location of the exhaust pipe, in about 80 to 90 percent of them in the UK are on the left hand side, which means that the toxic fumes are expelled towards the pavement at low level where they are far more likely to remain and affect, for instance, uh, young children, particularly if they are in uh, buggies or something like that. And whereas, of course, the um, motoring uh, uh, manufacturers could locate the exhausts always on the side opposite to the road, which would be uh, beneficial for the dispersal, dispersal of the exhaust fumes. And of course the reason why they don't do that is because they're thinking of the uh, overseas sales where uh, driving on the road uh, is on the other side of the road. It seems to me why it seemed to me why is it uh, that that consideration should prevail over the wider public interest, which is not to put out fumes towards uh, where pedestrians are moving, and particularly uh, uh, um, those uh, moving at, 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 low, at a low height. In this country, about twenty-five thousand people have been killed on the roads in the last 10 years. How is it that we are in effect prepared to condone such a horrific and avoidable loss of life? It's almost as if ritually every year like an Aztec, Aztec sacrifice one has got to uh, uh, have a toll of deaths on the altar of the attractions of motorised travel. I think a major explanation is the fact that when crashes occur, every effort is to put it as quickly as possible out of sight, out of mind amongst the general population, particularly among drivers. What happens is the ambulance comes uh, to take away the person to uh, hospital in all likelihood, the police arrive to uh, uh, determine the cause of the casualty, the garage arrives to remove the damaged vehicle, um, the, uh, every effort is made to, well, either the fire brigade comes in cases of fire and to clean up the road surface. And if you go by three hours later, you won't find any evidence of that horrific uh, uh, event having occurred. It's out of sight, out of mind. What can we do about that? Because I believe strongly that if the public were more aware of uh, the rising incidence of, uh, of uh, casualties on the road, of the number of them uh, that have occurred, they would be more, far more likely to accept uh, the need for local authorities and to, indeed to welcome the introduction of much lower speed limits, for instance, a standard 20 mile an hour speed limit in urban areas. Now, how could that be affected? Uh, what I proposed about 30 years ago was uh, that with the agreement of the bereaved family, um, the, there would be a roadside plaque uh, uh, put on the roadside adjacent to where that fatality occurred. Over time, of course, what would happen is that one would see more and more of these roadside plaques uh, with the name of the person who was killed, perhaps with some detail of uh, how old they were or some, something like that. I think it would dramatically alter uh, the uh, perception of uh, the 
dangers of uh, higher speeds and the need for um, measures to be taken to make it safer for people, particularly pedestrians and cyclists and therefore children and old people, um, if we had the lower speed limits by drawing attention to the consequences of uh, people driving at the high speeds, which of course are far more likely to cause the fatalities in the first place. Uh, the objection raised by uh, the Greater London Council, to whom I put this suggestion, was that I don't think it's a really good idea because it's, it's a bit too upsetting um, uh, to see where uh, and places where people are killed. It would be off-putting, uh, to which I replied, of course, that, well, I think society needs to be off-put about this uh, uh, unnecessary and, and avoidable loss of life. To date, as far as I'm aware, no local authority has introduced such a scheme um, in nor in that is putting a roadside plaque where people have been killed uh, on the roads. Uh, and one wonders why that is so. Is it they're, they're too squeamish or they're worried about the effects that this will have on people's perception of what's going on? But in practice, it could dramatically alter people's perception uh, of the, uh, of the uh, slaughter on the roads uh, and I, I really think to myself if one local authority were to introduce this concept and have the plaques outside the road I think uh, there would be growing pressure uh, for lo other local authorities to do the same and it would be highly beneficial in terms of the generation of uh, road danger seem to be an important element within the whole uh, policy on transport and catering for the growth in the demand for travel uh, by car in particular because it is the car that is the primary source not only uh, of the deaths of uh, drivers and their passengers but even far more so uh, the deaths of pedestrians and cyclists.